the goal of the discussion, uh, from my perspective tonight, is have more of a, a conversation, uh, a conversation around uh, engineering management, leadership, growing teams. Um, I think many, if not all of you, uh, certainly the majority I know, are, are leading teams of varying sizes. Um, all three of these folks have, have seen growth through kind of small to big. Uh, and so despite the size of their companies today, uh, I think the, the goal would be try to kind of reach the range of the audience that we have here tonight. So with that, I'm going to ask kind of each uh, person just to introduce themselves. The, the first person, Mike Curtis uh, from Airbnb. Oh, all right. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mike. <clears throat> I uh, lead the engineering team at Airbnb. Uh, I've been there for about two years now. Um, came over there from Facebook, where I was before, leading uh, their engineering, at least for their user growth team. Uh, Airbnb has gone through quite a lot of change in the last two years. When I joined, we were about 35 engineers. We're about 150 today. We're going to grow quite a bit uh, over the next year. So anyway, look forward to telling you all about it. Cool. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Huber. <clears throat> I'm uh, at Google, actually, as of the last year or so at Google X. Uh, I've been at Google for, actually, as of Tuesday, 11 years. I just had my 11-year anniversary. Oh. Uh, and over that time, uh, worked uh, started first on uh, building the uh, ad system. We got to work with uh, buddy Alex here, um, which is uh, most of how Google makes his money. Um, uh, then uh, helped bootstrap and ramp up Google Apps, our communication collaboration products. Uh, was involved in the early days of Google Maps and then ran Google Maps for the last couple of years before about a year ago jumping into Google X, uh, working on crazy new things, and maybe I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> at the point I started Google 11 years ago, it wasn't exactly still a startup. It was uh, uh, about 1,000 people, um, and it was uh, private then, but it was coming up in a billion dollars in revenues. And now 11 years later, it's about 50,000 people and 50 billion in revenues, so has managed to scale uh, remarkably well. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> that is an understatement. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Alex Rutter. Um, I run the engineering group at Twitter. I've been there a little over four years. I joined, uh, when Twitter was about 300 people, uh, and I joined the ads team. There were about eight of us building the ad system, which we've grown to about a billion and a half in revenue, which, you know, compared to Google is small, but we're still pretty proud of it. Uh, Good start. Four years in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, these days, I run the engineering group, which is about half the company. It's about 1,800 people. Uh, before that, I was at a couple of little tiny companies. Before that, I spent six years at, uh, at Google. Got to work with Jeff on ads, as he mentioned. Worked on a bunch of other things as well. And uh, yeah, look forward to chatting with everybody. Cool. So the, the <clears throat> first topic that I want to get into is around <clears throat> engineering management. Um, I, I, I know I have, and I think probably many of you have experience where, let's say you're, you're, you're a small, small team or small company. And you've got an engineer who's a great IC, where, but he or she wants to, believes that they want to be a manager. How do you kind of help that lead or whatnot test that out? And like, what do you find works or doesn't work when you have that person who aspires to be in management, but you think you know, he or she may not have that kind of EQ to do that? Let me tell you a story about a young engineer named Alex. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I never think you said I wanted to be a manager, great. for the record. <laughs> No, just kidding. Um, I'll, I'll start. I'm sure the other people jump in. Um, it's one of the, uh, so I think a good thing uh, about Google is that Google has a very strong technical ladder. Um, so one of the things I've encouraged people at Google generally to do is to go pretty far in the technical ladder because it's a, uh, it is a very technical place. And uh, we want the engineering leadership there to, um, uh, be strong in engineering and bring engineering value to their teams. So one of the things that I've had discussion with uh, a lot of young engineers who aspire for management, in some cases aspire for it too early, is uh, great, here's a set of things that you're doing well, you're doing right, you're heading the right direction, but it's too early. Keep, you know, instead of going into the management ladder and, and tapping out there because you haven't really developed yourself enough yet, here are the things that you should do from a technical development perspective to get yourself there and ready. While you're doing those, let's work on the management uh, properties that you'll uh, and leadership properties that you'll want to need, uh, so that you're the whole package uh, when you get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the way we the way we think about it is also kind of on you know you have to have like parallel ladders in individual contributor and manager. And the way we frame, framed it to people is that 
a shift into a management role is really like a lateral move. Like there's no actual compensation advantage. There shouldn't really be like an, author like an authority advantage to becoming a manager. And so if you get somebody who's an individual contributor really wants to be a manager but maybe isn't the right fit for that yet, what I usually try to dig into is like, why, like what is really motivating that desire? Is it a desire to like, because they feel like they can't get enough stuff done as an IC, or is it really a desire because they want the focus of their work to be on people instead of on maybe technology as much? And I think in, in a lot of cases, people have this misplaced belief that like, you know, by getting into management, they'll be able to just generally have more impact. I think that that's usually a conversation about how can you have more impact as an IC and really understanding that, that IC letter. Just one other point I'll make, which I think is along the lines of the things that you were talking about, is <clears throat> I think like the further you progress in the individual contributor track, sort of the more headroom you create from yourself for yourself in management later on. Because if you have like a really solid foundation in the technical underpinnings of what you do, you're going to be able to be a more effective leader long term down the line when you get into that management role. We've been spending a bunch. I agree with that everything uh, both of them said. We've been spending a bunch of time recently, actually, really trying to define what managers are and what engineers are, and especially what tech leads are. And really, I think the distinction between what a technical lead is and what a manager is can get muddled. And we've been trying to work on that, because we've seen a lot of people jump over to management. Uh, some people for exactly the right reasons, other people because I think we've muddled the roles and they just feel like it's a default thing that you should go do at some point. So in particular, we've been bouncing around this idea of a manager is a coach that exists to enable their teams but strategic direction and technical direction and real responsibility for the quality of what happens every day and really driving the product forward um, relies on the technical lead. So if you want to help coach people to do their best, <coughs> go into management. If you actually want to drive technical and strategic direction, go to be a technical lead. Um, and the reason we do that is I mean, we want to make the technical lead job really as attractive as possible um, because it's, it's ultimately, I mean, people doing technical work are what build the company. And then you can have fewer managers in relative terms who are really focused on coaching and empowering others. Um, and to answer your question a little bit more specifically, one thing we do is we give people, like, OK, you're the, someone's curious about it. It's like, OK, you're the technical lead of this project. You're also going to do some of the traditional management job as well. So you're going to deal with um, people who want to talk about you know, career development or things they're happy with, things they're not happening with, interpersonal problems. And you can kind of see what parts of that job they actually like. Because sometimes you find that they like the idea of being a manager, but they hate all the things that actually managers are supposed to do. And then they spend all their time doing the things that the technical lead should do. And then that's a good, it's like a very empirical place to come from and have a conversation about. I don't think you like the thing that you think you might like. Yep. <laughs> so um, you know, many of the, many <clears throat> the companies in the, in the audience today are, are clearly not necessarily as mature as some of the companies that the three of you are at. And uh, I can recall, you know, Alex, we rolled out the technical ladder at, at Twitter. Um, I saw it at, at Microsoft, had it at Palm. But you know, when is the right time to, to put that in? And I mean, one of the advantages of being a small company is to avoid, we'll say, a lot of the process or formality. But like, when, when do you get the sense of like, hey, you know what, we really need to actually put something in place so there's a career path for an IC so your great man, you know, engineers aren't just you know, believing that to have more power, they have to be a manager. Anyone? I, I can. I, I did it last year, so I, <laughs> it's like it's like a Not fresh a fresh yeah. memory for me. The right answer is last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, Has to be on odd years. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the answer. <laughs> Here's the thing I found about rolling out the technical ladder. Like when you first describe having a technical ladder and a, and a management track at the company, like. And, and just talk about it in general terms. It, people are very receptive. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. It logically makes sense. And then you do the stuff where you tell them where they're at in the technical ladder, and suddenly, <laughs> like, it all goes to hell. <laughs> so we we definitely did that last year. Um, I think that you, <laughs> I think that you have to, um, you have to have like enough. Like, I think in general, engineers are pretty logical people, and you have to be able to explain like why you're doing something in a way that's compelling to them to actually like justify an action that they might not otherwise have visibility into. And, and so the time when we chose to do it was really when the size of the team had gotten big enough where you couldn't just sort of intuitively tell where somebody was and give them a fair performance review. Like it started getting the visibility in the team wasn't great enough where you could really just do that based on feel. And instead we had to start having like calibration sessions where you look at people who are at a similar place in their career and see how they're performing against their peers. 
And the real like underpinning of why you did it was to remove the bias from performance management that happens sort of naturally in leadership. Like you happen to spend more time with this person than with <clears> this person, but this person might actually be doing better work, right? And so the latter gives you an opportunity to look at people that are sort of in the same in the same grade. If I if I could go back and change one thing about rolling out those technical tracks last year, it was I, I gave the direction that people shouldn't share their level with each other because with this idea of like, if they don't share their level, then we'll always Every, be- Everyone's a, an engineer? Which is, a, right, yeah. which is Facebook's <laughs> model. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's sort it's of kind of Facebook's okay. model, yeah. yeah. Like, like we don't publish it anywhere. Yeah. But I gave that idea because I was like, you know, ideas should always win, right? It shouldn't be based on like, you know, you're a senior principal engineer, so you always win against an associate engineer, right? Um, but I think what I would change is I would say, your level is your own. Like, it's something that, you know, that's where you're at in your career. And if you choose to share it with other people, that's up to you. It's your thing to share, but we won't share it for you. Like, that's probably the one thing I would go back and change. Hmm. Hmm. So, so does that translate into titles at all in the organization or no? I, I have been pretty strict about titles. <coughs> we, we only have two titles at Airbnb, which is uh, engineer or manager. So we haven't introduced any public facing titles at all that like people go and update on their LinkedIn yep. profile or anything Good. yet. There, there may come a day for that. Like I, there's pros and cons for it, but I don't think we're ready for it yet. Yeah. Good. I, uh, I actually, I think the answer to when you should do it is probably later than you think because you can never undo it, first of all. And I think it's really easy <laughs> to identify the problems that you would solve by rolling this out. But it's an, a huge amount of work and I've, I've seen one, got, when I was at Google, they rolled it out. And then when I was at Twitter, uh, I was involved in rolling it out. And it's in a huge amount of work, and you're going to get it wrong. And the Twitter one, <coughs> I was deeply involved in, and I still don't think it's especially good. And it was, a, especially my, it was my doing. And we've redone <laughs> it, so it's completely my fault. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it and seen it before. Um, and then we, we redid it to address some of the issues. So I think if you can spend all that effort on things to defer it for a while, that's really time well spent. It may be that it's inevitable and there are no 100,000 person companies that don't have one of these, so you have to do it one day. But you know, if the issue is I can't get recognized, I don't feel like I can have impact as an engineer. If you can spend time on giving engineers, pushing down a bunch of autonomy and decision making and giving engineers meaty problems and rewarding them publicly and recognizing them when they do things and giving them a stage to work with product or external partners or on strategy, that sort of thing, you know, that might be the way to address that concern. If the issue is something else, maybe you don't know who to talk to and you can, maybe you can implement something a lot more lightweight around like the point of contact for this project or the tech lead for this project or some communications mechanism. Um, that might help. It's not that it's a bad idea, it's just that it's an incredible amount of energy and you're gonna get it wrong in some way that's gonna make a bunch of people sad. And you're gonna spend, a, you could come up with the world's most fair, open, transparent promotion process and everyone that doesn't get it promoted is gonna think, it's not that they weren't ready to get promoted, it's that the process is horrible and they hate you now. So I would say, you know, if you can defer it for a while and really get at the root cause, like ask the people that are asking for it what it is they want, and then if you can address those, that might be energy well spent. Uh, and, and the one thing I'll add is just when you uh, do get to that point, um, start simple and keep it as simple as possible. It's always easy to add complexity later, or that will naturally happen. Um, so think about starting with three levels as opposed to 30. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Alex, you mentioned uh, recognizing engineers. And as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, that actually it's interesting because uh, across the continuum here, I mean, your company uh, is really design-led, I would argue, with Brian coming from RISD to a degree, engineering-led, and I'd say Twitter's probably a product slash uh, wannabe design. Um, now it's engineering. Wannabe <laughs> 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 design is the oh, It's been a while since <laughs> you were there. It's a simple product. I can say that. I worked there. But yeah. the point being, though, is that how do you actually, so you have these different kind of centers of gravity, right? Yeah. And I certainly saw this firsthand as we tried to stabilize the service at Twitter to get rid of the failwell, because there's just not a lot of recognition of, uh, we'll say, performance and stability as a first order thing to something shiny and new. Can you comment on this, like how you, what you found to be effective in recognizing engineers for the effort and not, especially within those kind of, we'll say, center of gravities? Sure. Um, I, can have, I can definitely start there. Um, first of all, Airbnb is a technology company. 
Um. <laughs> I, I, say this, like, I say this like I'm just looking at the founders. Yeah, okay, totally. That, when I make this comment, I'm looking at the founders saying, where is the, the center? Yeah, I know. I, I, only reason I say that is because I think we, we hear that a lot because yeah. of the design founders, because we care a lot about yeah. design. But really, at the end of the day, it always comes down to what can we get done in engineering? I think everyone in that room feels that same way with their company. Yeah. Right, you should. Um, and so, yeah, I'll we'll always, we'll always yeah. say that. Um, I think that the way that we try to recognize engineers in the team uh, for the work that they do is one that the things that are important like to the technical agenda of the company we try to actually get onto like the top level plan for the company so we have a very open planning process where you know we, we use okrs we've you know borrowed that from from <laughs> Google and others and um, you know our okr plan for the entire company is something that's like a public document that's in the entire company and there's top level like scale infrastructure and security and, and things like that that are on that top level list so the company realizes that we're spending the investment in it. How does that actually trickle down to the individual? I think that we try to bias more towards the people doing the work are in the room when there's a strategic conversation happening around what's going on, right? So like if there's a meeting with Brian about online security, for example, it won't be me sta sitting in the room representing the engineers. It will actually be like, maybe not all, but a selection of the engineers who are doing the work in the room representing their work. And I think that, that that's sort of like ultimately like putting more decision making and more visibility on the people that are doing the work, I think, is a great form of recognition. Um, I guess one of, my, my, one of my recommendations is try to make recognition a continuous process and essentially part of everything. Um, you know, everything from individual team meetings to uh, the communications that you have when you're communicating your goals or your OKRs, uh, as you're looking back and uh, sharing the, the progress the team has made or what your performance was against your goals, your OKRs. Um, Google has this model of uh, TGIF, of all company meetings every week, um, where people get up and share the latest updates on their product or uh, milestones. Those are all opportunities to be continuously reinforcing who are the people that really had an impact and made a difference. Um, so I would continue doing it encouragingly, uh, continuously. A model that, um, oh sorry, and then just part of continuous is uh, it should be, you know, continue across everything. The, um, you know, doing it in public forums I think is the best, um, but, you know, our compensation systems uh, have a lot of variation in recognizing people's mm -hmm. performance, people who, our top performers having the biggest impact get higher salaries and they get more higher bonuses and they get more stock. Mm -hmm. um, and that shouldn't be the primary, but it certainly is a reinforcement and people know it's a reinforcement for it. Um, one of the things that I think has been more problematic and I have very mixed feelings around is very, very high profile uh, recognitions. Um, Google historically has a model that we've internally called Founders Awards where uh, individual projects and efforts, and I think you were a winner of one of those at least, weren't you? I think, I, I think so. Because I, yeah. I was on your team. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, the uh, Founders Awards are, are great in concept, but the reality of them when across you know, 100 different projects that were fantastic of picking out the one or two or three, and then even within that, uh, as you get to the kind of scale of impact, they, they are very large teams and are cross-functional of where you draw the line of who was on the team, who wasn't on the team, and there was a financial dimension attached to it as well and how you apportion that. And because of the, the award, it's um, going to be um, you know, effectively public information uh, whether you want it to be or not. Mm -hmm. And I just found the complexity of that, of picking who was in and out, or picking which projects were in and out, the people that were in and out, um, created as many problems as the positive motivation it provided. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add to that is I think you can um, accidentally, we certainly made a mistake that we accidentally created the wrong incentives with what we were celebrating publicly. So when you're picking people, so we also, we have a weekly meeting called Tea Time. We have an engineering all hands that doesn't happen every week, but happens. Um, and we noticed that we were accidentally having people come up historically to demo, to show things that demo really well. Mm -hmm. And that created this culture by accident that people build <laughs> things that demo, that you know, they build shiny new buttons that look great. And you celebrate the launch. You don't actually celebrate where there's an impact that you care about. And so when you do that, you accidentally erode um, the emphasis on the quality of it. Did it actually move a needle? Was it instrumented the right way? And you can show an impact. So we've changed that recently to really you know, one of the last all hands, we uh, had a team that had built a more efficient storage 
um, storage server that we're using. It doesn't, doesn't demo very well, but really interesting talks and interesting graphs. So we had a team that came up that sped up, uh, sped up the build significantly, and we showed graphs about that. And so I think you have to think really, you can accidentally create the wrong incentives if you highlight the wrong things. I think public frequent recognition is right. I agree with Jeff about that. But you have to be really deliberate about what you highlight. And the other thing is, it's also nice to celebrate the val engineering doesn't always have to be about <clears throat> successes. So you can actually highlight at team meetings, find teams that made a mistake and want to talk about it and what, want to share what they learned. And if you ask for volunteers, then it's not a public shaming. And then it also reinforces not just that engineers are on stage, but also that you have a learning culture. And it's not about being right every time, but it's about learning from your mistakes and being better in the future. So that's another take that we've had uh, recently on recognition, which uh, I think is working. Um, before we shift off of management, um, <clears throat> I have a question on performance management. Um, it's one of the things I think many companies endure, especially fast-growing ones, is it. You know, you're you're going to make some bad hires, and usually those are the easy, obvious people that you have to get on a performance improvement plan and hopefully they improve. But if not, you have to exit. But it's the people in the middle, the good, the good enough, a band that, especially at startups, where you go, well. She's not amazing, but she's contributing. Or he's like doing. He's on this really critical project, so I don't know if I get rid of him. Yeah, he's good. He's not great, but like, and I think that's where oftentimes, not to say any of your companies, you know, as you grow, it can kind of drag you down the good. And so, what, what I mean in your careers, I'd be interested to hear what what have you learned on how to effectively manage out the good, <laughs> the non-obvious people. How do you identify and do that? Because I think I think we we'll all see that. I feel like I've been starting. So no, you guys, go I'll, ahead. I'll jump in. Um, so the model we have at, uh, at Google is uh, we have a um, quarterly calibration process where everybody in the company gets a quarterly calibration score. Uh, and then we, the overhead of that was getting a little high. So now every other quarter, we have a uh, management team gets together and does a calibration process going through those scores and uh, just making sure that at different levels that uh, the scores are meaningful across. And for larger organizations, it's done internally at a kind of roll up at the very highest level. It's uh, you know VPs or SVPs getting in, uh, together and comparing. It's a reasonably thoughtful process. Um, but one of the things that we do is take different looks at that, of who are the very top performers, and are we making sure that we're providing the uh, best opportunities or development so that they're continuing to, to be superstars and having a huge impact. Uh, you look at the bottom of where are we having performance issues and what are the contributors uh, uh, to those issues, is it uh, uh, wrong skill set? Is it um, uh, you know motivation issues? Is it they've been in the project too long and they're just kind of burned out and stale on that? And we have to tap them on the shoulder and move them to something new. And getting back to then the middle, um, uh, we do take a look at people who've been in a project for an extended period of time, two years or more, doing the same thing, um, or people who are just kind of good but are bouncing off. They're, they're not one of the bottom performers, but they're just kind of trudging along. And uh, one of the most consistent things that we find is, yes, they, they need some new inspiration. They need to be you know, repotted and put in a different place to, to be given an opportunity to shine. Mm -hmm. And um, hmm. um, that's the approach that we try to take to it. We don't, um, we don't do a company-wide calibration. It's <laughs> not to say we never would, but we don't right now. But we, we try to distribute more to the local engineers and ask them, OK, you're trying to do x, y, and z. How many world-class people would it take to do that sort of thing? Like, OK, so your team should be that size. So now think about, you know, do you have the right mix of skills so that you can get as much done, assuming that you have x world-class people? And there are all times, I don't think the problem is identifying the middle people, because I think you can sort of, most uh, team leads will know who their best and worst people are, and then they can subtract, and everyone else is in the middle, basically. Um, but it's really more, what do you do? I mean, it doesn't seem right to go, let all of them go. It doesn't seem, you know, you don't want to have all of them switch. Sometimes it's motivation, and they need to find another home. Sometimes it's just they might have been, you know, with some very specific coaching, they can actually raise levels. The one thing that we found is you always think you're giving more clear, actionable feedback than the person who you're giving it to thinks they're receiving. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's just, I, I always get that wrong. I see a lot of other people get that wrong. So a lot of times, if you identify those people and you go are very explicit with them, like, hey, you're, this is going great. This is not going great. How do we move from here to there? You sort of learn. Like A lot of people can be a lot stronger just w with one-on-one -on -one coaching if all the managers actually do it. Some people actually get it. Like, yep, it seems like I'm doing OK work. I can't, in this, for whatever reason, 
do amazing work. So there's either a different team in the company or a different company or something like that. But the main thing we've really tried to do is get all the leaders to think about, you know, you're running a SEAL team. You're not running like a ground inventory, right? So you want a small number of really elite people that can all do their best. And if you don't have that, go dive in with all those cases. And maybe some of the people shouldn't be there. Maybe other people are not getting the feedback that you think you're giving them. And then you can kind of go from there. It takes a lot of energy, but I think it, it pays off. Can maybe add, well, one other philosophy that we have, um, you know, it, it sort of ties back to the, you know, the career ladder stuff that we talked about before. But, you know, our, our career ladder starts at L3, goes L4, L5, and up from there. But an L3 would be kind of like a new grad. And if you're a new grad right out of school, we have this, yeah. <laughs> does this sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, have a, uh, we have an expectation that you're going to progress. So if you, you know, if you haven't progressed or like aren't really looking like you're going to progress to L4 after about 12 months, we're going to start asking questions. Like maybe you're not able to grow as quickly as the company needs you to. If, and it's similar from L4 to L5. So if you're not, you know, after about 18 months, or maybe two years at L4, if you're kind of hanging out and it's not looking likely that you're going to make it to the expectations of L5, then we'll start asking questions about that as well. And that's sort of where I think plenty of people tend to, maybe not, not plenty, but a few people tend to wash out at that level. Once you've made it to L5, our philosophy at least is, if you can be successful at L5, you've kind of like made it. You found your level. Yeah, you feel like, <laughs> like you're doing enough, like you're having high enough impact work at the company where you can be successful at that level for a long career with us, and that'll be fine. Um, but you know, your peer group is ever getting stronger, and we do calibrations, right? And so hopefully that expectation even for successful gets higher and higher over time. Hmm. I mean, one, one challenge I'll throw out that uh, uh, for provoking people is if you're the manager of a team, if you're the tech lead of a team, and you know, as you're assessing the uh, impact of different people um, you know, for the ones that aren't up to your expectation, would you rather have a new person coming in the door, um, you know, uh, whatever you get from the lottery, or would you rather have that person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is you would rather have the new person in the door, the one that's there is not mm -hmm. the right one for Always your team or your company. Always clarifying. Yeah, that's a yeah. great, great question. Um, I, I lied. I have one more question. Um, <laughs> so with your direct reports, how often do you have one-on-ones? Um, weekly or bi-weekly? Yeah. Depends on. Uh, I do 30 minutes a week. Um, with all of my direct reports. Mm -hmm. I'm the same, I'm 30 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. Cool, so I'm gonna just pause to see if, if anyone has questions, and if not, I'm gonna keep I had something to that actually. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. He, sorry. Um, I was gonna add to that, I used to do, I had a larger team, one, I think my highest number of directs at one point was 35, which was a mistake. Uh. <laughs> when I did that, I, had, I kept spacing the one, so it was two one-on-ones every three weeks, and then I went to one every two weeks. Uh, and then I kept the one every two weeks for a while, even when the number of directs went down. And I found that when I upped the frequency of one-on-ones to back to weekly from bi-weekly, I actually had a lot more time. Because just being uh, more in tune with what everyone was doing, I was less reactive. There were less surprises. So by adding all that extra one-on-one one time in, I saved a lot of time. So I don't know if that's generally useful, but I, I was surprised by it. And then in retrospect, it makes sense. Um, I am almost to a point where I have nine directs. And it's kind of a big question. I have another team that I am putting a manager in place for, but nine leaders. Yeah, so I, uh, Alex peaked at 34, was it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think of the most ridiculous at Google, I had 86. Um, <laughs> that was roughly, I'd actually, were you one of I think I was one of the managers, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you didn't have bi-weekly one-on-ones with all the managers. <laughs> I think I did quarterly. I think I did roughly <laughs> quarterly. Uh, <laughs> quarterly then, or, or whenever I ran into people in the micro kitchen. Um, no, so clearly that uh, 86 or 34 is a, is a crazy amount. Our general guideline at Google is uh, on the order of, uh, uh, which has evolved um, because the, um, uh, right answer for a while was up to 86, uh, but uh, our general target is on the order of 12, um, and a minimum of seven, mm -hmm. if you're a manager. This is a conversation that I have with with managers um, usually when they when they become managers. Is that you know. You're, becoming a manager doesn't mean you're not an individual contributor anymore. It just means you're contributing something different. And so it's not, 
like it's not like you're not doing the work. You don't just sit in meetings all day and tell people what to do. Like I think that there's <laughs> there is a significant portion of management that actually is individual contribution. It's thinking about and like writing up how a team is going to interact with another team and then rolling that out with the team and like talking to people about it. Like those are individual contributor projects. I I think that like a manager a, a great manager works for their team, right? Not as much the other way around. I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but I think it's actually true. And the way you work for your team is through some of the individual con contribution work that you do that's around helping people be more effective. So the thing that managers always, we think of managers and tech leads as two different roles, and then a human can either have one or both or, or neither of those. So the manager of the role, it's really just enabling your team to be better than they otherwise would be. So coaching them so they can be at their best, removing roadblocks like any organization accidentally creates roadblocks for people, not out of malice, it just kind of happens. So removing roadblocks, understanding what people could do, getting them the things that they need that they don't feel like they otherwise can do themselves, and then also pushing accountability and autonomy down so they essentially don't need you. So if, that, if you're doing that job, that's kind of the management role. And I think the tech lead role is really about actually the technical architecture and decision making and strategy and that sort of thing. The reason I bring that up is there are some managers who are playing both of those roles at Twitter. Generally, those look like managers that have more like seven reports than 20 reports. Um, and then they're on one project. And so if you're doing that, you have to be explicit that you're actually doing that. Otherwise, you, you should manage a much bigger team and then make sure that you're pushing all that stuff down to tech leads so you can have thriving tech leads on the team. <laughs> Precious unicorns. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I agree that they exist. Yes. <laughs> Me too. And, and, and it's more like 100 or 1,000 as opposed to 10. Yeah. Or actually infinite, because they can do things that normal people can do. I agree that they exist. But you oftentimes at a startup, you may have you know this person who is that that 10x at one point in time when they're the big fish in a very small pond. And as that pond grows, he or she may not be able to adjust that. So I mean, do you have any comments on how to help either people through that, or maybe they're not the right fit for the company? I mean, what? I mean, I think that's true. Like, companies are growing. You get people that are excellent at one stage, and it might not be the right fit. So I think it's important to ask people what they want to do. It may be the case that you can often organically grow into things that you would never have signed up to do. I mean, the classic case of this is you join a small place uh, as an engineer, and you're really good at it, and you're like pretty decent at EQ. And so they ask you to manage something, because now we need managers. And you say, OK, and you do a pretty good job. But you end up one day, maybe two years down the road, you end up in this job that actually you don't, you don't want. And you, see pe you notice that, because people that are great, and maybe even have been great in management or in, in leadership roles, uh, just they start to their performance starts to decline in kind of a subtle way, and you can usually people notice that. And so if you just ask like, "Hey, are you doing the thing that you want to do?" Oftentimes people will say no, and it's important you build a culture where you can uh, you can make changes that usually you wouldn't think people make. So um, we have people that go from management since I'm thinking about management. We're just talking about it. Mm -hmm. That people will go from management back to being an engineer, and that's awesome. And I yeah. actually those are the people like I never congratulate people when they become managers. I I. Part of me dies inside a little bit, um, but uh, when people go the even, other even way, no, you twisted their arm to get them. Yeah, there. well, you know, people can be hypocritical, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, when people go the other way, I actually go out of my way to to congratulate them. And it's not just going to management; it's also you might be the tech lead of a three-person project, and that's awesome. And all of a sudden, you're asked to be the tech lead of a twenty-person project, and now the mix of your own code writing versus code reviewing is just not what you personally want to do. So it's important you give people outs and don't define implicitly this kind of one-way march that you're supposed to progress to bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, and I, th and I think setting that culture that your impact is not measured by the size of team that you have, so that you can do things like that, going between uh, I was managing a, a, or leading a 20-person team, now I'm leading a three-person team, that is just as noble and just as good, and that team can have as or bigger an impact than the 20-person mm -hmm. the, the team had. And back to your point earlier on the, uh, on the job ladders, technical ladder, management ladder, keeping those so that they grow in parallel, so the people, it can be very fluid if people go back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I've definitely had situations where people were you know, pretty senior uh, uh, managers, leaders, directors, uh, that just got to the point of, of hitting the wall on, you know, I'm, I'm kind of had management, I want to go back and be technical. And enabling or having a culture where you can do that mm -hmm. um, is really positive. This, 
You, you probably want to move it along, but this is such no, an no, 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 no. I, I find it fascinating as someone who's jumped back and forth. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd, in my career, so. I'll just call out like one one pattern just on the 10x um, engineer question that I, that I think you sometimes see in small companies that go to big companies is that like a lot of times the 10x engineer in the tiny company is the one who like works on like the you know the CEO's pet project and like <laughs> you know ships this amazing thing and does it in 24 hours and like you know 20 Red Bulls later or whatever and leaves like this crazy trail of tech debt in their wake. You know, like stuff that's going to have to be cleaned up later, and and I think like you know as the company matures, that stops being something that's celebrated as much. And so you know, <laughs> because the other engineers around are like, dude, what did you do? To us? <laughs> and like, I, I I think that the the real 10x engineers are the ones who actually like skate towards like like this is the area that I can have the most impact right now and have like a very good internal compass for like this is what the company needs the most right now. And a lot of times that can be like the least sexy work that needs to happen, but actually is like the highest impact thing and like the people who are willing to do whatever it takes even if it's not the like bright shining thing that the CEO is paying attention to but like move move things forward I think that they're like the enduring 10x the, the grungy work that makes everyone else better I mean, like what, one of the things that we've done is, um, and one of the things that we try to do in general is, instead of coming up with like policies and rules and like this, you know, this is how you do X, Y, and Z, is to instead come up with things like principles around uh, like how we're going to do development. And so we have like we have a set of principles that we follow when we're building new backend systems, for example. And it's it's things like you know you're going to use the stacks that we you know agree and know how to operate with unless there's some reason why those stacks can't satisfy your needs in which case we'll have a bigger conversation or like you know this is how you're going to handle monitoring this is how you're going to handle inter service communication so we we basically set like guidelines or like principles around how you're going to do that development but then we don't like dictate that you know you have to do it exactly this way or or, or that way we um we do two things one sounds a lot like that we have a set of engineering principles which are 12 things and they include things like consistency, appropriate reuse, iterative development. So those are guidelines that we hold everyone accountable to working towards. And in fact, on the annual review and promotion process, you talk about your impact that you had on core metrics and also how you work, where that's essentially, do you work according to the engine principles? But then all those specific architecture question, we have a group called the TAG, the Twitter Architecture Group. Um, and it's a bunch of senior engineers from different areas in the company. And they're not like the blessed ones that make all the decisions, but you can go to them and ask them questions. And we'll pose, it's run by your CTO, and we'll pose uh, questions to them when we have thornier, broader issues that kind of affect a bunch of independent groups. Um, they read a bunch of design docs. They write their own design docs. So we kind of go to them when we have bigger architectural issues. But it's definitely a trade-off. I mean, if you have every group running independently, you're intentionally paying for that with a little bit of chaos and maybe not a global optimal. But that's a trade-off you want to make if you don't want to centrally plan everything. Yeah. And um, so agree on those. The one one uh, thing I'll highlight, you brought up a question of, of whether or not there are separate architects that do things. And I think it was implicit in what you were saying. Uh, at Google, our, our mindset and model, and I felt strongly about it before getting there, but Google had already made the decision. There's no, there, there are no architects, there's no architect title. Um, and I've just seen too many places, other organizations that I've been in, or in one case, I even ran an architecture team uh, that had those titles, uh, where the architects become the dictators of things without necessarily being the consumers and, and users of it that have to live with the implications. And, um, you know, I had already come to that conclusion, thankfully Google had, of uh, there's no such thing as separate architects or people who are building things and whatever you're architecting, you're living with the implications of because it gives you much better yep. insights on its use. Uh, but then the other piece, uh, uh, and I think very complimentary to what you mentioned, is uh, the Google model is just transparency around every system. Uh, there's common ways for being able to see the availability, uptime, performance of all of the systems. So, um, you know, there's, by having that transparency, there's, uh, reinforcement for the team working on it, the pride of, of what uh, are they achieving the appropriate targets and goals. And then if anyone else that's using that product or infrastructure has issues with it, they can, you know, it's very easy to point to and say, hey, your you know, latency for the service is not acceptable. Um, the data is always there and it's a uh, common uh, lingua franca. Uh, I'll start. Just a truism I've observed: that there, there is no such thing as the perfect org chart. Um, 
and there are some classic models of either being functionally based, so you've got the, the vertical functions of engineering and product and sales, or there are um, uh, product unit, business unit structures that have the product business unit first and then they have those functions underneath. And whichever model, you, there isn't a right answer between the two. Um, whichever model you do, you, wherever you have the seams, are where you have the problems that you need to manage. And that's really the role of management and leadership to fix, <laughs> fix those. You also tend to see a uh, dynamic in many organizations that there's a periodic swing between the two of you are having problems in the one model, so you are having problems with the, uh, uh, the business units being too siloed, so you swing towards a functional model, and you do that for a couple of years, and then uh, it's too hard to get things done horizontally, so then it swings back the other direction. Um, there's a natural rhythm. <laughs> I, what, what it, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that uh, you just have to be, kind of like Jeff said, they both have their own upsides and downsides. So first, you have to think about what problem you're trying to, like what is the most painful thing for you right now and that would be the highest leverage you solve and then organize around that one and maybe in two years it'll be different. <laughs> and then the other thing is really spend a bunch of energy in addressing the known cons of whichever option you choose. So we happen to be organized functionally. And so we do a bunch of things to try to minimize that. So we'll make teams sit next to, even though you report functionally, you sit around the same table because I think a team is defined much more about uh, by how they sit, like where they sit, than how many different managers they have. So we do that. And then we also pair up engineering and product leaders one to one. And we have sort of simple but silly rules. So you know, if I go email a team on the consumer side, I'll email both uh, the engineering and the product leader. And if I'm asking a question, I'll CC Kevin, who is my, my counterpart. He runs all the product at the company. And there's simple things like that. And I'm never allowed to complain about Kevin for being the stupid product guy. And he's, to my knowledge, at least, <laughs> never, allowed, never allowed to complain about me. Like we, we have, it's, our, it's our joint problem. And we try to push that, that culture recursively to all the teams. But you know, that's because we're intentionally trying to address the issues of the functional model we've chosen. If you do the other thing, you know, you have consistency problems, then you probably have to pour intentional energy into addressing those. Yeah, and I'll expose one of my biases, which is um, I, I do personally prefer the functional model, uh, and Google uh, pushed the functional model just about as far as it possibly could. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits for the functional model, uh, <clears throat> but then, you know, ultimately, about three years ago, Google moved to more of a, a, a product unit oriented product area model. Um, that said, it was you know, 25,000 people and mm -hmm. you know, billions of dollars in revenues before it got pushed there. So, so one thing we were trying to solve, and the reason we're functional is engineering consistency. And we don't have the as strong a culture of exactly one way to do everything. Having worked in the Google stack for years and years, that is the case, that there's exactly one way to do every single thing. And you can boot up any binary. And it's very easy to work on a different uh, team's binary. And so we didn't have that. And we want to get closer to that, which is why. We chose the functional model, and it sounds, I left, I left Google before they went to the business unit model, but it seems like having that base of a culture has probably helped you guys. Even and and you having that architectural foundation, certainly, yes. Right. I think I, I agree with everything, everything <laughs> that I heard there. They just said it probably better than I could. Um, I, I think maybe the, the one thing, I'd, I've, like, I've lived in both of those worlds, like um, functional or like sort of GM model or whatever you want to call the other one. And um, now that you observe, about every two years it was a different. Yeah, and <laughs> and like it's it's because of all the pros and cons that are uh, that are on both sides. Organizations tend to swing and like try try different things over time. I think that maybe the one point I'd add is I don't think that's always unhealthy. Like I think people always think that when you restructure a company or like organize a different way that it's like oh no it's another reorg or whatever, but. I actually don't, I'm not sure that that's always unhealthy. I think sometimes it redraws lines of communication in a team that actually gets people who wouldn't normally talk to each other talking to each other. And doing that, like, you know, if that happens, you know, two years into one model and then two years later, like, you know, nobody likes a, a big reorg. I'm, you know, there's pros and cons on both sides, but it can actually kind of help fuel a little bit more com uh, communication in the company. It's very, very topical. <laughs> question uh, for me. We, we have not introduced a director of engineering title yet at, at Airbnb, uh, but we've got some people who are getting there, and like it'll, you know, it'll, it'll come up in the next year or two. The way, I, the way I've described this to them is that I think that you know, being a really solid M2 like 
you know, what might be called like a senior manager or something in another, in another company, is really being able to affect change on all of the engineering team and maybe even like parts of the overall product organization, right? Like how do we do what we do within that sphere of influence? Um, I think that the difference between a really solid person at like what I would call M2 level and a director of engineering is a director of engineering should be able to affect change on the entire company. And like I think when you're at that director level, you should be, you know, have like a good rapport with all the executives of the company, be able to actually like be able to influence and change the direction of things that are happening on the whole. That's good. No, I, a little bit more. I, I think I uh, agree with the measure that a uh, director of engineering should be a, viewed as a leader within the company. Um, and you know, secondarily, just in terms of the scope that they're responsible for, the kind of impact that they're having, you know, it's hard to, to create a single metric. But when you look at a combination of their leadership properties, the scope and complexity that they're managing, the size of the team, um, that, that's what defines it. We make being successful as a manager being a prereq. So can you, first, you have to be able to build a healthy team of engineers. and have them execute in a way so that they're very high functioning and you can build the team so that you yourself are kind of out of a job. That's a prereq. And then the other thing is, can you think about your team as a team of teams? So are you able to assemble and hire not just great engineers, but also find the right leaders and put those in place and make sure they're working cohesively as a unit so they have a sense of their own team and the culture of their team and their purpose and also the broader organization that the director is running. Um, so, and you know, it's, it's the same as going to management. There are people that are great engineering managers that are not good directors. Um, and vice versa, though not as often, because you do at least at some point need to have shown that you were a great engineering leader. Um, so we have people that have been directors and then went to be an engineering manager, and they're much more successful. So you, that's, a, that's a hard one, because that's not switching ladders. That's <coughs> actually moving ladders. And usually, you consider that moving down the ladder. So that's a harder one. But it's, there are times when that's absolutely the right thing, not just for the company, but also for the person. So we've done that a couple of times. It's important to allow that degree of freedom. Otherwise, people would never try something higher. The general guideline that I've followed is that you know, we want most of our leaders to come from inside uh, the engineering team, and, but not all of them. Because I think that you need to bring some people in who've got great leadership experience elsewhere that can help balance the room a little bit and like, you know, bring their experiences from before. Um, we have taken like kind of a controversial tack on this though, which is that we we never let anybody start as a manager at Airbnb, and so it's <laughs> a prerequisite when you join the company that you're willing to at least spend up to six months in the code before you could take on leadership of a team, and you know that has made hiring managers pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, that, that's like, a great bar, and and well, it's it and it's kind of like, <clears throat> but we've brought in several people from outside the company who were directors of engineering leading big teams. When we talked about that, they were like, I'd love to spend six months in the code. That sounds awesome. Like, I, and, and it's like this selection tool almost of like bringing in the people who are ultimately going to be the kind of people that engineers are going to want to work for. So that, that's worked pretty well for us. Right now, our leadership team is probably about, I guess, maybe 40% people who came in from outside who had been leaders before, and probably 60% 60, 60 people who just came up as ICs. Yeah. It's a similar model of, of we uh, tried to very much have a promote from within culture. And uh, the default for any opportunity that came up was, was promotion from within. Just given the rate we were growing, we couldn't pull it off uh, uh, completely. But I do agree that the value of having fresh eyes, fresh perspective uh, is very good as well. So it was you know, on the order of probably 70 to 80% of our uh, leadership opportunities were filled from within and 20 30% from outside. And if you look at Google now and if you look at the senior management ranks, it's you know, the, the vast preponderance of, uh, of VPs, senior vice presidents, are all people, uh, not all, 80% of them were people who went from individual contributor or first line manager up through the ranks. We found it's easier. I think that's a great bar to have, have someone managing a team who could be an engineer on the team. We found, we've had more success in making that a rule to come into start for the first level manager than oftentimes there are people that have been directors, VPs, other places that it ends up being a different job a little bit. You get a little rusty maybe in your actual coding skills. So we bring more external people in, I would say, at that level. Um, than line managers, I think it's pretty rare that we'd make an external hire there. Um, but that being said, you know, you always, always try to bias towards, like, like both of them said, bring uh, 
hiring from within you can. Um, when it comes to not just onboarding, but before onboarding, I think an important thing to keep in mind, not just for hiring managers, but especially for hiring managers, is you bias a lot more towards reference checking and figuring out people that you know and calling them than you do. It's very hard to evaluate a good man. It's very hard to evaluate anyone uh, in an hour in a small room, but it's even more hard when it becomes, you know, are you an effective leader of teams? So you should do this for everyone you hire, but especially for managers and directors. Spend a bunch of time reference checking. You get much richer signal than you get uh, sitting in a room with someone. And, and highly qualified references from your existing employees are, are gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think on, on that hiring, I mean, one interesting thing that I'm just thinking of is that um, when, when I was at Twitter, we grew from 50 to 400 or so, and 80% of that was from internal referrals. Um, how, and there's different ways to kind of mine that. I'm kind of interested in, you know, how do you think about referrals, incentive programs, and then kind of the part of that question, I also want to hear how much, what percent of your time is actually spent on recruiting? So kind of two. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, Re recruiting is probably the top thing that I do. Like, I, I think in, in in any given day, I probably have like three sell calls or like sell to get them to interview calls. Like, I spend a huge amount of my time on the phone with candidates and like bringing people in. And I'm, I'm actually like, I, we're we're at a different stage than you know Google and, and Twitter. So like, I'll talk I'll talk to an intern, you know, like to get them into the company. Like, it doesn't matter who it is. Like, I'll, I, still, intern? I still do that. <laughs> you still do that? All right, Absolutely. good, good. So I've got that to look you, forward you, to you forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, great. You got this for the next ten years. <laughs> yeah. All right, perfect. That's why right. I love those calls. I always like leave that kind of call like so like fired up. Um, I, spent, I spent a huge amount of time on, on recruiting. I think that the other thing that we do is we, we tell everybody who joins the company that, like every engineer who joins the company, like in their first week, we tell them that recruiting is part of their job. Like they have to do the work. Like we're in like this mode where we, we have to hire people. So like interviewing, being a great interviewer, leaving even the person that we're gonna reject with a po like really positive impression of the company to go out and tell their friends is part of everyone's job. So we kind of like draw that in really early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Google grew through references, yeah, and the core mindset was that uh, uh, we did our best to make sure that there were great people at Google, and great people know great people, and that's the you know best way to, uh, most efficient way to grow, but also the highest quality by a long shot. Um, I personally had a, a model where anytime a new person came in the door, literally the first day when after they were welcomed and greeted, it's like, okay, who are the three smartest people you know? Um, <laughs> what are their names? The email addresses, phone numbers, great. <laughs> we, we'd love to have them here. Why don't you give them a call? I'll give them a call. Um, you know, in the, uh, it has, uh, uh, just given how much Google has grown, the, the pace of growth, the organizational growth is a little less now, but at the peak times during the crazy days of growing the ads and, and apps teams, it, I spent a third of my time recruiting mm -hmm. yeah. uh, between interviewing and um, um, you know, going out and uh, uh, chasing references and selling. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we definitely, on, on referrals, uh, you mentioned a referral like bonus program or whatever. Like, like I think those are effective. Like, I'm really skeptical on them, but like, I was yeah. wondering if you've seen yeah. effective and ineffective. Yeah. I mean, like, we have one, but that's not why anybody yeah. refers anybody, yeah. right? It's like, it's like nice that they get this thing in their, you know, in their in their paycheck or whatever. But people refer people because they want to work with great people, mm -hmm. and like yep. that that's, that's what drives the yep. referral program. We used to have one. We let it time out because it, sort of for that reason. Um, I'd say I spent about between maybe 25 and a third or even up to 50% some weeks of time recruiting. But I would say it's, it's time you spend recruiting and chasing references and that sort of stuff, but also time spent teaching people how to interview and evaluate candidates is also time very well spent. So we've spent a bunch of time writing a bunch of material. What does a good technical interview look like? What does good feedback look like? We built our own recruiting tool um, because we needed to optimize exactly the process that we've been running. So time, we teach a bunch of courses. We teach all the new hires how to interview. We, when we read all the feedback to make hiring decisions, we also uh, mark areas, hey, you know, we think this interviewer could be stronger if we talk to them about X, Y, and Z, or this is a really great example of feedback. So then we fold that into continuing education for specific people. So that's also time that goes in, which is very high leverage, which is why, why we do it. I don't yeah, well, as you much do, as you I would don't. like, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you have to, I mean, pragmatically, I found you have to pick your battles. Um, that's something I've personally felt very strongly about it. I don't want to let things go entirely. Um, uh, you know, at, at work, I will pick uh, grungy things of, hey, there's some uh, analysis or, or something that the team needs and nobody else can do it, uh, so I'll do it. Um, you know, I pick projects, uh, pet projects at home that I do in my spare time between midnight and 2 a.m. Um, 
you know, so I have a, a home automation system that I was annoyed at the interface for, so reverse engineered how it worked and tried to uh, create my own and before confirming that I suck at UI. Um, <laughs> so it was worse than what I had before, but at least it was fun going through the process. <laughs> I felt less rusty when I was done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, typically the way I, I approach it, and I am rusty on, on the technical side, like I would never, I would never claim otherwise, but, um, but I try to take on projects that like aren't in the critical path. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm totally not dependable. Like, you know, if you're, if you're relying on me for a ship date, then you're pretty much screwed. Um, but like, there's a lot of work that needs to be done anyway that's kind of additive and that I can take on. Like, pro probably the most recent project that I did at Airbnb was a pretty big refactor of our real time dashboards. Like, for, for metrics and everything, it was just like janky code that was written a long time ago. It needed to be refactored. And I wanted to add like growth accounting for supply, like the number of listings on the site, because I just was excited to see that in real time. And so I just, worked on that project because nobody was depending on it, but it would be something that was additive. Analysis jobs are good. They have, they have that property. Doing code reviews is helpful. Talking to people about designs and asking questions is good too when you don't actually have time to dive in and write a bunch of code that's going to ship. Well, we are now out of time. Mm. Uh, I want to thank Alex, Jeff, and Mike for, for coming tonight. Big round of applause. Thanks. And I know, I know there's a couple other questions. I don't know if you guys will be around for a little bit. I know you guys are really busy. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to just share your experiences with the group.